please have a seat. Morning, everybody. Um, it's good to see you all. Uh, again, if you're here as a visitor, if we haven't met before, uh, my name's Matthew. Uh, I'm one of the pastors here at Summers Road Mission. And it's great to be together, isn't it? To gather, to praise God, to give him the glory and the thanks that he deserves. Um, a few, I think it was a few weeks ago, it might have been months now, um, we went as a family to, to Shibden Park in Halifax. It's a, it's a lovely park. There's all kinds of things to do. Um, there's a little model railway. There's a, um, you know, a playground. Um, you can tell um, it wasn't mainly me that was taking us to the park. Um, you know, and it, we really enjoyed ourselves. And one of the things we did there is we went and looked round. So it's one of these parks where there's a kind of old house at the top. Um, and I think originally it was the, you know, it was the grounds. Um, so after we had our picnic lunch, Henry and I decided we were going to go and do the historical tour of the house of Shibden Hall. Um, and I'd never been to Shibden Hall. I didn't know that much about it. And it's a, you know, it's a house with lots of interesting history, you know, lots of sort of architectural details, um, different things going on. And when we went in, you know, the main focus of all of the kind of, um, you know, this, the kind of information boards and, and those kind of things was one particular um, lady, Anne Lister, who um, was in charge of the house for some time. She, she lived between 1791 and 1841. And if we just go back a slide. Um, and she, she was the, um, she was the, can we just go back a slide, is that right, Sharon? We'll come to that in a moment. She was the landowner, um, and she did all sorts of work, you know, really developed the land and the house. So a lot of the kind of details we were looking at were things that she'd done during her time there. But what she's most well known for now is her diary. So she kept a very extensive diary, um, five million words, and half of that was public. You know, it was written in kind of slightly scrawling handwriting that was describing, um, it was describing her um, kind of development of the house, the business, things she was involved in, her travel. But half of it was private. It was about her private life. And that was all written in a code, you know, so that people couldn't read it. And actually, that described a life of um, lesbian affairs with different women, um, you know, on her travels and then women who lived with her. And it was very, it's very graphic. So she's known for this diary. And that diary was, um, after her death, that diary was discovered by one of her relatives, John Lister, who was the last kind of family member to live in the house. And he discovered it with a, another person, at, um, his friend, Arthur Burrell. And they, translate, you know, they cracked the code together and they worked out what she was talking about. And um, that was at the end of the 19th century. And when they realized what she was describing and how graphic that was, Arthur suggested they should burn those diaries. They should get rid of them because of the shame it bring on the family. In the end, what John did is he, he bricked them up behind a wall and, and hid them away. Now, they were rediscovered um, in the 1980s, I think it was, um, by a lady called um, Helena um, Whitehead. And she found those diaries again, and again, she worked hard and she cracked the code. Um, but, you know, actually, those diaries now um, have been shared and celebrated um, so if you go today, um, Shipton, I didn't realise this until I went, Shipton Hall is known for Gentleman Jack, that's where they filmed that TV series, which kind of um, plays out the, the, uh, the life of Anne Lister and celebrates, really, um, her as the, the first modern public lesbian. And, you know, when you go, that's what everything's made of. And you, as you leave, if we can have that slide back up, uh, Sharon, you know, you, um, they say they've got more people coming into Shipton Hall than they've ever had. And as you go out, there's a big rainbow flag in the middle of the park. Now, I, I wonder, you know, that left me thinking, what do, I, what do we make of all that? It shows, doesn't it, how much our culture and our times have changed in, in those two different reactions. In just over 100 years ago, actually, as people read that, they wanted to hide it away, maybe even burn it. Whereas today, it's celebrated, it's paraded. You know, what do we make of that? I'm sure there's things like that in our culture, and it, it gets us asking, like, what, what is going on? in the world around us? What do we make of all this? Maybe we're asking, where's God in all this? Well, the passage we're going to look at this morning, Romans 1, verses 18 to 32, gives us an answer to what's going on in the world around us. It's not an easy answer, but it's an answer that we need to hear. But before I, I read that and we look at that together, let's pray together. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a speaking God. We thank you that you don't leave us in the dark. We thank you that you speak into our world and into our lives with your truth. And Lord, we know that you are the creator. You are the God who has made us. You know what is right. And so this morning, we pray, Lord God, that you would help us to hear your voice. Lord, it's not about what I have to say. Lord, we want to hear from you. 
And you know each of us, Lord, you know our lives, our situations, you know how, where we stand before you. And we pray this morning that you would speak into our lives. Lord, that you would show us more of what's really going on in the world. And aware that these things are hard, would you give us hearts that are willing to hear them? But also, Lord, we pray that, that we would respond in a way that is honoring to you. Lord, that our outlook and our heart would be more like yours. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Romans 1, starting at verse 18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. It's not an easy passage, is it, to hear? You know, this is Paul's letter, um, written in the middle of the first century to believers in Rome. But one of the things I find remarkable about this passage, it could have been written today, couldn't it? You know, God's eternal word speaks into our day, just as it did then. And, you know, in terms of the context of the book, in this, we've had the introduction last week. In this section, so from 1.18 right up to kind of 3.20, Paul's argument is that all people face God's judgment, whoever we are. And he starts really here focusing on the Gentiles, the non-Jews, we might say the pagans. Uh, but then he's going to come next week, uh, when Bruce is preaching, to, to look at the religious, you know, the Jew, and say, actually, they too face God's judgment. But our focus today is, is, is more on the pagan world. And Paul says the pagan world around him is experiencing God's judgment right now. So think about that question that we had at the beginning. What is going on in our world? Well, the answer in Romans 1, 18 to 32, is that we are experiencing the judgment of God. We are experiencing the judgment of God. So it said in verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. What is the wrath of God? You know, it, the, the, God's wrath is his righteous, settled anger towards evil. And it's different from our anger. You know, our anger sometimes is righteous, but often it's unrighteous, isn't it? Often it's about the wrong things or it comes out in the wrong way. God's anger is always righteous. It's not some hot-tempered reaction. And it's his righteous, settled anger towards evil. And actually, when we hear that, we realize God's wrath is a good thing. It's a good part of his character. It's the right response towards evil. But here we see the problem is that evil is in people. God's wrath is being revealed against the godlessness and wickedness of people. There's an evil towards God, godlessness, and towards one another, wickedness. So Paul's writing and describing how, you know, to these Roman believers, as, as they look out on the world around them, God's wrath is being revealed. 
And we might think, look, that, that doesn't seem fair. You know, these people around them, they don't even know about God. How could they expect to do any better? Well, do you see how Paul kind of answers that right at the beginning and says, no, God has revealed something of himself in creation. People know enough about God from creation that they're accountable. You know, think about if you've, um, if you've ever been to like an, into an art gallery, you know, and you, you see a painting kind of on a wall in the distance and you're just struck by its beauty. You know, maybe it really captures a beautiful panorama that you know. And, and you're drawn in by that painting. Or maybe it's a painting of a person, but it's captured their likeness so brilliantly. Now, you might not yet have read that little plaque that goes next to it that tells you who painted it and all the details about the author. You don't know about the painter. You know, you don't know the artist. But as you look at that painting, you know something about the artist, don't you? You see their skill. You know, you see their intention. You see their ability. And Paul says it, it's something of that with us as we look at creation. Creation doesn't give us all the details about who God is, but as we look at creation, we see enough of his power, of his majesty, enough that we're held accountable. You know, for me, um, I uh, was baptized when I was 13, and that was when I really personally acknowledged and came to the Lord Jesus. And the first step in that journey was um, being blown away by God's majesty and power in creation. I was at my grandparents. They, they have a... Um, a sheep farm near Pendle Hill, and I was up on the moor looking out across the trough of Boland, um, and it was a beautiful sunset. And I was struck by God's power, by God's majesty. You know, there are times, aren't there, when we look at creation and we're blown away by, by who God is. And I realized I couldn't ignore this God. I couldn't just live my life as if he didn't exist. I need to respond to him. And, and Paul says, actually, that all of us have seen something of God in creation. We've seen enough of God that we know we need to respond, that we're not ignorant. And, and do you see how Paul uses that language of people suppressing the truth by their wickedness? And that's an active thing, isn't it? You know, our, our culture often talks about the problem of living a lie. You know, I used to be living a lie, but now I'm not. Well, Paul says that actually the, 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 the deepest lie that we're all living in is that we're living as if God doesn't exist. You know, that, that's really what it means to live a lie at, at the most fundamental level, is to live as if God doesn't exist when all of us see enough of him in the world that he's made. Now, that might ask, you know, that this um, diagnosis that the world around us is experiencing the judgment of God, I guess that raises a couple of questions. Why? You know, why and, and how? What does that look like? And that's what Paul then addresses. So firstly, the why because we've rejected and replaced God. You know, what is God's problem with humanity? Well, let me read again verses 21 to 23. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. It's a problem about worship, isn't it? People don't give God the worship he deserves. Maybe um, think about it this way. You know, think about um, a, a child growing up in a family. And they've received everything they have from their parents. You know, the house they live in, the food they eat. And let's say this child has been loved generously by their parents in all the toys they play with all the experiences they enjoy. Now, just imagine that you kind of went into that house for the first time and you know how loving and generous and kind their parents are. And then you observe something. You saw that the child completely ignored their parents. You know, when they came into the room, they didn't look at them. When they spoke, they'd never answer them. They'd never listen. they just act as if they weren't there. You know, maybe it was even worse than that. And they said, look, just go away. I want the food, but I don't want to spend any time with you. you know, when we start to imagine that, if we saw that in front of us, we would know, wouldn't we, there's something deeply wrong there. Deeply wrong. That's not okay. And Paul is saying that is what we as human beings naturally do to God. He has given us every good thing that we have. But so often we ignore him. Or even more than that, we reject him. He speaks and we just ignore it and go our own way. And Paul says that's the big problem in our world. You know, that's the real issue. We've rejected God. 
And it, it kind of gets worse because it's not just that we've rejected God, but that we replace him. So instead of worshipping him, we end up worshipping things that he's made. You know, all of us are worshippers by nature. And if we're not worshipping the living God, we end up worshipping something else. And that, that means in the end, we end up worshipping things he's made. And we can think, oh, that's not us. That's kind of ancient civilizations where they'd make a little statue and have it in the home. We're not like that. And we might think we're more sophisticated, but in the end, if we're not worshipping the living God, that's what we're doing, isn't it? We're worshipping something in creation. Again, think of, you know, think of the art gallery. You know, when we were living in Chicago, there was an art gallery in town, and um, it had some of um, Monet's water lilies, and we used to enjoy, you know, particularly in those paintings. And when you, when you go into that room, you know, what's everyone saying? Everyone's saying, oh, Monet was amazing. You know, he was so skillful. It was remarkable how he could just capture the kind of, you know, the atmosphere and the sense of that scene. You know, it would be perverse, wouldn't it, if we went into that room and no one was talking about Monet. And people were just amazed at the paint. And they were saying, that frame, that frame makes the painting. You know, or just remark about the lighting in the room. Or the wallpaper. We'd miss the point, wouldn't we? But that's what we do by nature. If we're not giving God the glory, what are we doing? You know, we're giving that glory and worship and praise to things that he's made. We're giving the credit that God deserves to others, or maybe even to ourselves. You know, people still worship today, don't they? I remember reading a book, and it was talking about how the, the temple of today is the shopping mall. You know, as you can imagine, it was American and pre-Amazon. But, you know, you get, you get the idea. Where is it now that people go to worship? You know, so often it's consumerism, isn't it? It's things that we're looking for. Or maybe it's the football stadium. You know, again, it, it's fine. These things are good things, aren't they? It's fine to enjoy football. But to worship our favorite player, you know, so often to hold up these celebrities, people that God has made, as ultimate things. And Paul is saying that's the problem in our world. Instead of worshiping the living God, we're worshiping things that he's made. And when you put it like that, you can think, why do we fall for that? It seems so obvious, doesn't it? Why do we fall for that? Why don't we see what we're doing? But did you notice in what Paul was saying that as we turn away from the Lord, there is also a blindness that comes as we turn away from the Lord, there is also a blindness that comes. He talks about thinking becoming futile, foolish hearts darkened, claiming to be wise but becoming fools. People don't realize what's going on. You know, it's like if, um, you know, when, when it's nighttime and you're, you've maybe got a bedside light. If you're right by the light, you can see, can't you? But if you get further away, you can't see anymore. And it's like that with God. As we reject him and turn away we go into the darkness and away from the light. But we don't realize. Or think of when you're out walking. I was, um, uh, we were um, with a family yesterday and their daughter at the moment is on Duke of Edinburgh. And I, I brought back all sorts of memories. I love Duke of Edinburgh. Um, but you, know, you get lost on Duke of Edinburgh, don't you? When you're out walking in the hills um, and you're trying to follow a map, you get lost. And the time that's worst in terms of getting lost is the time when you think you know where you are. You know, that's the worst. If you, if you know you're lost, you do something about it, don't you? You know, you, you go and get help. You spend time really looking at the map. The time when it really goes wrong is when you look at what's going on around you. You take your compass bearings. You look at the contours. You know, you look at the, um, the, the woods and that kind of thing. And you, you get your map out and you think you've worked out exactly where you are. And you get your confidence up and you set off at a good pace. But you've got it wrong. That's when you get really lost. Because suddenly you walk 10 miles in the wrong direction. And that's what's going on in our world. People are lost, but they don't realize it. And actually, that's when we're really in trouble, isn't it? Because we're not looking for help or for a way out. So that's the why. You know, why is our world experiencing God's judgment? Because we've rejected and replaced God. What about the how? You know, what does this look like? Well, Romans 1 says that God gives us over to our sinful desires. God gives us over to our sinful desires. I think normally when we're speaking about God's judgment, we're thinking about something to come, aren't we? A day to come. We're thinking about the day when Jesus returns and everybody is judged. And Romans will speak about that day, even in the next chapter. But actually, Paul here is talking about a judgment in the present, a judgment that's happening now. And again, I don't know what comes to mind. If you think about God judging in the present, we, we tend to have a slightly naive picture, don't we, of thunder and lightning and that kind of stuff. But here, Paul says there's a judgment, but it looks different to that. God's judgment on the world is actually giving them over 
to their sinful desires. Do you see that um, come up three times? You know, there in verse um, 24, therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts. In verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. In verse 28, um, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Actually, God's judgment is to give people what they want. Have you ever thought about that? It's a different way to think about God's judgment, isn't it? God's judgment here actually is to give people what they want. The, the illustration that came to mind, it's a bit trivial in a way, but um, if any of you have uh, read or watched the story of Matilda, there's a character called Bruce Bogtrotter. And, and Bruce, um, he's at school, uh, and Bruce um, steals the head teacher's chocolate cake. You know, so he's got a desire for that chocolate cake, which is not a healthy desire, is it? That's not his cake. He's got a desire for that cake, and he's punished. He's caught and he's punished, and his punishment is to sit in front of the whole school and finish the cake, and it's a massive chocolate cake. Do you see, his, his judgment, his punishment is actually to be given, <laughs> I'm not sure that picture is needed probably, but is, is to be given what he desired. But, but actually, that was a judgment on him rather than a blessing. And that's something of what's going on here. God's judgment on our society is actually to let it play out, is to give people what they think they want. We might think of it, you know, again, it, you know, imagine a parent with a teenage child. You know, and they, they've got to the age where they can really make decisions for themselves, or think they can. And life is starting to go off the rails. They're starting to use drugs. They're starting to make friendship with people who are an helpful influence on them. But they don't see any of that. They think they're finding freedom. You know, they've dropped out of school. They're no longer looking after their health. And they're a bag of bones. And they say to mum and dad, I just don't, I, I, I don't want to be here. I don't want to live with you anymore. I want to go and be with my friends. I want to go and have fun. And there might come a day, mightn't there, where their parents say to them, then go. go. Go live with that person you think is a friend. He's actually a drug dealer. Go live with them. That moment is in some sense a moment of judgment, isn't it? Now that teenager might not realise that. That teenager thinks that's freedom as they get their desires. But that doesn't lead anywhere good, anywhere healthy. There's something of that going on here. And that challenges our cultural narrative, doesn't it? Because what, what does our culture say the story is? The, the, our culture says, here's the story. Finally, we've grown up. You know, finally, in modernity, we've thrown off the shackles of religion and all that stuff. Finally, we're free to really live out our desires. It's a narrative of progress, isn't it, and freedom. But you see how Romans looks at exactly the same picture and says, that's not what's going on at all. Actually, what's going on is that you're experiencing the judgment of God. Not all desires are good desires. Actually, you're enslaved to those sinful desires. You know, some desires it's talking about here are degrading rather than empowering. Think of a garden. You know, when we, um, uh, when we moved into our house, the person who'd owned it before us had been a very good gardener, which has been a real blessing to us because we're not very good gardeners. Um, and, and so actually, the garden is really well ordered. You know, there's different sections, there's fences and hedges, there's boundaries. You know, there's different walls that keep um, some sections away from other sections. You know, there's, there's um, flower beds and places to put vegetables. There's places where there's fruit trees, and it's all been ordered and structured. Now, imagine when we came into the house, you know, we looked at the garden, we thought, oh, it's just, it's too contained. There's all these fences and kind of boundaries and divisions, and we just want it to be free and really to, to, to live and grow and you know, not be hemmed in. That's our vision. And so we started to take down the fences and we, we got rid of all the divisions and the flower beds and we kind of, you know, anything that was getting in the way, we just, we demolished it in, in a vision for freedom. Well, what's going to happen in the garden? It's just going to be a chaotic mess of weeds, isn't it? We know that. That actually those boundaries and divisions are there to enable life to flourish in a healthy way. And it's the same in our world. God is the great gardener. God has made our world. And in creation, he's, he's put in these divisions and boundaries and separations, not to oppress us, but actually to enable life to flourish. And as we break those down, it should be no surprise to us that chaos ensues, that there's a, there's a form of decreation that goes on. And Paul particularly, doesn't he, here, 
in verses um, 26 uh, to 27 focuses on homosexual activity as, as a, um, a particular um, manifestation of what God's judgment in this culture looked like. And these verses are pretty clear. They're clear, aren't they, that, that um, c- celebrating homosexual relationships in this way is actually part of God's judgment on a culture. These verses are clear that that's unnatural. It, they're described as shameful lusts. And unnatural here doesn't, unnatural means it going against God's natural good order in creation. You know, sometimes that's interpreted as what's natural to us, what feels natural to us. But that's, what, that's not what Paul's meaning here. He's meaning, actually, those relationships, that activity, it's unnatural in terms of the order, the good order that God has put in his creation. It's going against God's ways. You know, right in the beginning of Genesis, when God makes the world, it's clear that sex is for marriage between a man and a woman. And actually, any sexual activity outside of that is unnatural. It goes against the good design that God has put into nature. I think today we see a similar thing with transgenderism. I was listening to a podcast this week, and it was um, focusing on transgenderism. Uh, and one of the one of the um, kind of news articles that it, it focused on was um, a recent interview where um, a senator, Senator Black, but this is in the U.S., was asking a Supreme Court nominee, uh, Judge um, Brown Jackson, so a, a, a judge, um, and she was so she's. It was part of her interview about whether or not she'd be nominated for the Supreme Court. And the question she asked was this. She said, can you provide a definition of the word woman? And this, um, this judge said, no, I, I can't. I can't do that. You know, that's the place we've got to, isn't it, as a culture? That was the States, but I think we're not far away. And in some, because we're, we're ignoring biology, we're ignoring God's good design and creation. A woman is an adult human female. There's a simplicity to that, isn't there? But today we're ignoring biology and nature, chromosomes or genitalia, and we're saying that actually it's about how we define things, how we feel. And as we break down God's good boundaries, we're getting ourselves in trouble. God made it very clear, didn't he, in the beginning? You know, what's God's declaration? So God created mankind in his own image, In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. That's God's good declaration in creation. And so should we be surprised that when we reject that and we say, I know actually God, I'm going to go and do this my way, we're going to do it our way, that we're getting ourselves in a mess. We're in the garden, we're knocking down all the fences, if you like. And now we're in the situation where in some contexts you can choose from a list of 100 genders. We're lost, aren't we, as a culture, but we don't realise it. We think we're progressing. Now, it's easy for us to go wrong here. It's easy for us to think that, whether it's homosexuality or or transgenderism, it's easy for us to think that's what's wrong with our world. And if we could just get rid of that, go back to the 1950s, we'd be fine. But you see what Paul's saying? Paul's saying these are the symptoms rather than the disease. The real problem is that we've rejected and replaced God. And that probably started in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. You know, people say we don't need God, we're fine without Him. That's the real problem, that's the root issue. Actually, Paul is saying that celebration of homosexuality or transgenderism, that's a consequence of that. That's actually God giving us over to our sinful desires, that's a judgment that He's given to us. Think of COVID. You know, when, um, when suddenly you're eating your meal and you can't taste, you know, the curry, you know something's up, don't you? When you've lost your taste and your smell, you know something's up. But that's just a symptom, isn't it? You know, if you know anything about a COVID, you don't try and fix that with a nasal spray and some throat sweets because there's a root issue, which is a virus. And actually your body has to attack the virus if that symptom's going to be dealt with. And it's the same here. You know, what is the root issue in our culture? It's that we've rejected and replaced God. Unless that's dealt with, we're not going to have any success in dealing with the symptoms. And, and it's important to recognize here that there's other symptoms. 
You know, actually, while there is a focus here on homosexual activity and relationships, that is not the only symptom, is it? If you look at verses 28 to, to 31, there's other symptoms of this root disease. There's greed, you know, and maybe that one gets at us in different ways. You know, we, we live in a, an economy, don't we, where things start to fall apart if people don't keep buying things they don't need. There's envy. There's gossip. Arrogance. Boastful. Disobedience towards parents. You know, and some of those things are kind of a given, aren't they, today? All of those things are symptoms of this root disease of rejecting and replacing God. And there's a blindness in all this. People don't see they're lost. We think we're free. You know, look at verse 32. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. That's what's going on right now at Shibden Hall, isn't it? Or with Gentleman Jack. There's a celebration of these things which are against God and his ways. So what do we do with all this? What do we do with all this? Well, there's four things that come to mind. The first is I hope as we read Romans 1, actually it brings some conviction. God here is telling us what's going on in our world. You know, we can look at these things and actually the symptoms are telling us about the disease. You know, our culture is under the judgment of God because we've rejected and replaced him. Now, that's not comfortable, is it? But actually, it's helpful to be clear about what's happening. You know, it means that we don't need to be taken in. Sometimes that's not easy. When our world talks about love and inclusion and progress, it can sound so good. But actually, as we read Romans 1, we can have conviction in this. We don't need to be taken in by where the world's going. We can see through that. It's important to be teaching passages like this to our kids, isn't it? You know, they're growing up in, in a context, a cultural context, which is confusing. But God speaks into that. But it also means this conviction that we don't need to be worried as believers. You know, it isn't that God is absent. It's just that at the moment, part of how we're experiencing God is in his judgment. And actually, I find reassurance in the fact that, you know, this is written nearly 2,000 years ago. But all this has happened before. You know, it's not new, actually. The, the same old problems and rejection of God comes back around. And God still rules. He's not about to be unseated by, from his throne by this progressive sexual agenda. God still rules. It's just that now part of his rule is his judgment. Now that conviction is not necessarily a comfortable one, is it? You know, maybe actually we feel conviction this morning. Maybe we, we look at that description of people who knew something of God but don't really glorify him or give him thanks and maybe we think, that's my life. That's my life. I kind of know, I've always known God is there but I've never really given him the time of day. You know, maybe we see that for what it is. Or maybe as we read this, we're thinking about those around us. Our family, our friends, colleagues, our city, our nation. And we start to realize they're experiencing the judgment of God and they don't even realize it. And I think this is where the, the second application has to be humility, doesn't it? Humility. You know, this isn't comfortable. It's like when you go to the doctors and you receive a difficult diagnosis about something that's going on in your body. That is not a nice moment, is it? It's not an easy moment. There's a sadness and a heaviness. But there's also a gratitude, isn't there? You're grateful that the doctor has told you about that. Because actually now you can start to do something about it. And I think it's the same here. This isn't comfortable. It's heavy, isn't it? There's a sadness. But also there should be a gratitude. Because as we see clearly, then we can start to do something about it. You know, I think um, one of the, one, I found it heavy preparing this and preaching it. And one of the reasons I found it heavy is it would be easier, wouldn't it, if it was simply that this is all in the world out there. But the reality is there's also the world's in me. There's also a, a great extent to which day by day I don't give thanks to God. I don't give him the glory and the praise that he deserves. I take credit. I give credit to others. You know, sexual immorality is a struggle for me. Envy is a struggle for me. So it's not as comfortable, is it, as just pointing out there and saying, there's the problem. 
You know, we see the world in us too. So there needs to be a humility as we hear these words. You know, there's no room, is there, for gloating or for smugness. There's a, there's a sadness and a heaviness. I think the third obvious response is evangelism. You know, do you remember what Paul had just said, the, the verses before, what we finished on last week? You know, thankfully, it's not just the, the wrath of God that's been revealed. So remember what Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You know, we have good news of rescue, don't we? We have a lifeline to throw to people. So that's an obvious response, isn't it? That, and, and, you know, when you think about the fact that people are lost and don't realize they're lost, what can get through? Well, the gospel can get through. It's the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. There is good news. There is a king who has come, a king who is good and righteous and holy, but also a king who has made a way for rebels to be reconciled, a king who has made a way for sinners to be righteous. There's good news, isn't there, that breaks into our world, that means this isn't the end of the story, this isn't where Romans finishes. There's a righteousness that's revealed where actually we can be friends with the king. So I think this spurs us to evangelism, you know, as we realize the reality of what's going on around us. I remember um, hearing someone's testimony, and they spoke of, they'd had a really hard upbringing. They'd suffered quite a lot of abuse as a child, um, and kind of through their teenage years, that had really led to rebellion um, and crime and drugs, And they said that throughout that time, they always saw themselves as a victim. It was never their fault. It was always because of what had been done to them. And they had lots of grounds for that, humanly speaking. But the thing that changed in their story was the book of Romans. And this guy said, actually, when I read the book of Romans, it hit me. I think he said it stuck me like a knife. Because it made me realize that I was part of the problem. Actually, that that I had done wrong to others. That I had done wrong to God. And actually, we need that moment, don't we, if we're going to come to God and ask for his help. So um, conviction, humility, evangelism. I think the fourth response that came to mind is prayer. As we realize that this is what's going on in our world, that the world around us is experiencing the judgment of God, does it not let us cry out in prayer for mercy, to cry out for our nation and our friends and our city, to cry out for repentance that people might turn back to God again? To cry out for the reformation that comes when God's spirit's at work in people's lives. To cry out that people return to the Lord. I think that's where this has to end, doesn't it? You know, as we realize what's going on, that we will come to God and ask for him to relent. Ask for his mercy. Not because our culture deserves it. You know, as we look at our culture, we we deserve God's judgment, don't we? We have enjoyed so much good from God and we've turned around to him. We've said, God, we, we don't need you. We've moved on from you. We can do things our own way, thanks very much. We deserve his judgment. But don't we need to come before him in prayer and ask him to be merciful for those around us? So before, we're going to sing in a moment, but I thought actually we would finish this morning with an open time of prayer. So let's, let's stand together. And let's just have a time where I encourage you, if you want to, to, to pray out. Um, pray nice and loud if you want to pray so we can hear you. But let's spend a bit of time praying, asking God for mercy um, for the world around us. That the, the light of the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus would break through and people would turn back to him again. Lord, we pray um, for our nation. We pray for our city. We pray for those around us. We we pray, Lord God, for your mercy. Lord, we do see um, real brokenness as we've wandered from you. Uh, We do see the damage that that is doing in people's lives. And we pray, Lord God, that this would be a God, there would be a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. We pray, Lord God, that there would be a a crying out uh, to you. We pray in your mercy, Lord, you would open people's eyes that we might see our need and turn to you again. 
Lord, we thank you for your mercy to us. Lord, if there is any sense to which we, we do see these things, it's not because of some inherent goodness in us. Lord, it's only because you've been kind and you've shown us in your word and in your son. Lord, we know the truth, you know, but by the grace of God go I. Lord, we know that. And we thank you that you are a merciful God. Lord, we thank you for the grace that we have enjoyed. We thank you that this is not the end of the story. We thank you that there is a saviour, a king who has come, a rescuer who has made a way for, the, for rebels to be brought back into the family, who has made a way for us to be restored and renewed and made right again. Lord, we praise you for the Lord Jesus. And we, we pray, Heavenly Father, that um, you will give us opportunities to speak of him. Lord, you will give us opportunities to point people to him. Lord, we thank you for your grace to 